Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Diversity Health Series. Um, I see in the chat that there are some students in the waiting room, so hopefully uh, we will work on getting them admitted. Um, welcome to our second Diversity Health Series um, of this academic year. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Nicole Jacobs, and I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion. Um, we are recording this event, and um, hopefully if the recording goes well, we will be posting it in a couple of weeks to the uh, website for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, the goals of the Diversity Health Series are to offer training in order to enhance the cultural sensitivity and competence and humility of the healthcare workforce. Um, I'd really like to thank Dr. Jennifer Doherty for all of her assistance in putting this together. Um, and um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Again, um, we are recording this. Um, please keep your microphones muted. Um, if you want to focus on the person who is speaking, go ahead and use speaker view. Um, if you have questions, um, our speakers have asked that you put them, you type them into the chat and hopefully we'll have time to address them um, after the talk. If not, we will try to address them and post the answers um, along with the recording um, on the ODI website. Um, if you need continuing medical education credits, please make sure that you contact Jennifer Doherty to get the form and please have that filled in and back to her um, within a week. If you are a student of the practice of medicine, you don't need to sign in, just please complete the reflection and upload it to Canvas by 5 p.m. this Friday. So with all of that, I'd like to um, get to our main event and introduce to you our wonderful speakers today. We have Dr. Shruti Mithal. Um, she is a developmental and behavioral pediatrician with Atrium Health in North Carolina. Um, we also have Dr. Sylvia Pereira Smith, um, who is an assistant professor, developmental behavioral pediatrics at the Medical University of South Carolina. Both of them are part of an organization called RaceCard, which they will tell you more about. Um, we are so thankful for them uh, to for putting together this presentation, looking at structural racism um, in healthcare. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much, Nicole. Hi, I'm Shruti Mittal. Um, thank you for that warm welcome. And we're so excited to be here with you guys today virtually. Of course, it would be much better in person, but um, we're excited to be able to talk to you guys about this really important topic that's near and dear to my heart and Sylvia's heart as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, okay. All right, so our topic today is structural racism in healthcare, and I already introduced myself. Um, but um, Sylvia, do you want to give a shout to? Sure. Hello, everyone. Sylvia Prayer Smith, developmental behavioral pediatrician. Shruti and I um, were fellows together, and it is my pleasure to work with her um, and talk to you all about this subject. Thanks. So first off, we just want to say thank you so much again for inviting us to talk about this. Um, I think racism and subjects of race are really hard to talk about with mixed company. We have all sorts of diversity in our audience today, I know, um, and it can be really difficult to talk about. So as our mentor, Dr. Adia Spings Franklin would say, we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and so thank you for being open and being flexible and letting us talk about uh, this really difficult tough subject today. Thank you in advance for allowing yourself to grow. Um, I know that I'm growing and learning about my own racial identity every day. Um, and that's partially because of our mentor. So I wanna do a special thanks to Dr. Adia Spinks Franklin, who was supposed to be here today for you guys, um, but you got us instead um, because she's definitely mentored us through this process and helped both of us find our own racial identities over the last couple of years. I'll let Sylvia share a little bit about Race Card. Um, so Shruti and I are two of the founding members of Race Card, which stands for Race and Children Education Collaborative of Anti-Racist DBPs. Led by Dr. Spinks Franklin, in 2017, we initially sought to educate professionals in our field about racism and child health, but we expanded to present nationally on projects such as racism as an ACE, racial ethnic identity development, and complex ADHD in children of color, 
always, our mission is to be anti-racists who work to dismantle the system of racism and racial oppression in healthcare throughout education and training. And these are some photos of us um, around the country. Next slide. So we have no financial disclosures. The only disclosure I'm gonna share with you guys is that Sylvie and I have both um, had um, experiences with racism. A little bit about myself, I was born in India. Um, so I'm a first generation American. I moved to America when I was about seven. Um, there's a picture of my family in Switzerland and I'm, I'm the girl in the red. Um, and you know, my disclosure is that I've lived the model minority myth of Asian Americans pretty much all my life until a race car. Um, and now that I know what that is, and all of you guys will know what that is by the end of today, um, I, I live every day to, um, to try and advocate for myself and fight my own internalized racism. So in addition to being a race card member, I'm a Latina who moved to the U.S. when I was four years old, and I am trilingual, um, having learned the languages in the order that are presented. Um, and that is a picture of my family and I shortly after we moved to America, and I am the, the one in red as well. Um, we just want to take a second to um, give our land acknowledgement statement um, to honor the native land of our ancestors. Um, we acknowledge that we live on the land of ancestors of our ancestors of many different nations and of the indigenous people of North America. So we just wanna pay respect to them. So after today, um, we have a couple of different objectives that I hope you'll leave here um, with. And so first off, we're just gonna define some racial vocabulary that's pertinent to structural racism so we can all be speaking the same language when we're talking about issues of race. We wanna identify the layers of stru structural racism within healthcare because racism is really prevalent from medical research to the C-suite within institutions. And so we really wanna talk about how racism exists within all these levels. So that way we can try and work towards dismantling it on, on all the levels. Um, and then we're gonna try to put racism and an analogy, so I'm gonna ask you guys to bear with me while I try and make this analogy make sense to y'all as racism as a, as a societal pathogen and how this pathogen gets passed down and transmitted and replicated and then causes disease in society. Um, and then you guys are all gonna leave here with fantastic tools to promote an anti-racist healthcare system. So although I myself write often about how presentations save the best for last, meaning the stuff I plan on incorporating in real life, it is very important with this topic to start at the very beginning and cover the foundation for this work. And that means racial literacy, which allows us to develop strategies to counter and cope with racism. So I wanna make sure that when we speak, we understand the terms we are using so we can use them correctly. Coming from someone who English is my third language, English is quite confusing. R-E-A-D can be read or read. Terms mean different things in different contexts, different fields use different uh, similar words, forgive me, but can carry different meanings. So for example, one of my biggest pet peeves um, when I was a med student or a peds resident was when the word lethargy was misused. I was taught that lethargy meant very sick in appearance, needs to be hospitalized, maybe a step or two before some type of shock. But parents would often use that word when I myself would have used the word malaise. Um, Shruti, I think it's um, the, the slides. Oh, I'm are so sorry. Okay, I can <laughs> what you guys can see versus what I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. So we've been told that our audience is familiar with racial vocabulary, so we're going to go through these slides quite quickly. But I did want to highlight some important per, uh, important important points per slide. In this slide, for example, I want to address the fact that race is not based on science and is instead a social construct that is based on real or perceived differences in normal variations. Next slide. On this slide, I'd like to highlight that in regards to microaggressions, it's impact and not intent that really matters. Next slide. And then for this slide here, I cannot stress enough that racism is tied to power. This is why reverse racism isn't really a proper term since racism comes from the power in a dominant group. Next slide. Here, both of these prevent open discussions of the reality of racism and how it affects us all. So it really limits the conversations for growth. Next slide. 
And the path of anti-racism involves action. Um, so that's something that I really, really want to highlight. Um, to be a, a growing anti-racist really requires action on a variety of parts. Next slide. Um, so I mentioned that language can be confusing and we wanted to point out that structural racism is at times referred to as systemic or institutional. And it was actually one of the first conversations that we had when we got together for this grand rounds. Um, but we wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Next slide. And so in that conversation that I alluded to, um, we uh, proceeded to uh, go with structural since racism pervades many areas. And we felt that it was um, more of appropriate of a term for uh, the discussion we're going to have today as opposed to systemic or institutional. Next slide. And I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, Sylvia. Is this showing up in presenter view for you? Um, it has the big slide and then the uh, little slide on the side. <laughs> Beautiful. Now it's a really big slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so to help frame the concept of structural racism, um, it really makes sense to see it through the lens of social determinants of health, which are neighborhood environment, health, health care, social and community, education, and economy. Next slide. So in 1934, the Federal Housing Administration um, allowed for neighborhoods to be graded, which is based in a really large part on their racial makeup, with red zones consisting of racial minority residents. This allowed for systemic denial of services, such as mortgages and tax breaks. And even though redlining was outlawed over 50 years ago, the effects still remain today, such as continued lower property values, so less school funding. Next slide. Less school funding can have an effect that ranges from hiring of less experienced teachers who struggle with understanding the complex needs of students of color to inequitable resource allocation, so less access to extracurricular activities, fewer guidance counselors, etc. Next slide. Okay. Sorry. So data has shown that children of color are disproportionately suspended, expelled at higher rates than white children. And this study that um, is shown here uh, really highlights that Black and Indian American boys were um, more likely to be suspended than white boys for similar infractions. And trouble at school can lead to a child's first contact with the criminal justice system, hence the term school to prison pipeline. I highly recommend the 2016 film called 13th if you haven't yet watched it. Next slide. So structural racism has been highlighted with the path um, as a pathogen, a pathogen, forgive me, um, that recently changed our lives, COVID-19. So people of color are dying at higher rates and they are disproportionately represented in employments that place them at higher rates of exposure. Next slide. All right, thanks so much, Sylvia, for that great outline about what structural racism is. Now that we know all of um, the definitions that are related with, uh, with, um, with racism, we're going to talk about that analogy I mentioned at the beginning. So racism as a sided pathogen. And this is something which Dr. Franklin came up with, which I thought was super eye-opening and helped me understand all the complex layers of, of racism that exists within healthcare. So let's go back to the basics. I know that all my med students here know this probably better than I do, but what is a pathogen? A pathogen is an organism that causes damage or disease. So we're gonna talk about racism as a pathogen that eventually causes disease in society. So what are our characteristics of pathogens? So first, a pathogen requires our host to survive and it's gotta live somewhere. So it lives within a host and we're gonna figure out what those hosts are and how do we get rid of the host. And then a pathogen has to be transmitted from one host to the next. It's gotta replicate. So it's gotta become, it's gotta happen again and again. And then once there's enough of them, it causes disease. And once we are aware of the disease that is happening, it causes a, res a response in the host, which is typically to get sick. Um, and so if you're thinking about racism as a pathogen in all of these steps, you really need treatment at all steps to break the cycle. So let's start with the host. Is your institution a host for racism? We have to think about that. So where does racism live? 
Racism lives within the government. It's present in our laws, our policies, our practices, our traditions every day. It is in our institutions, so in hospitals. It can be in our policies and practices and strategic plans. It can be in groups, families, and then all the way down to individuals. And so we're gonna talk about all these different layers, but focus on the institutional aspect of racism. So when we're looking at healthcare and if our institutions are hosts for racism, let's look at our recruitment and retention plans. And this is looking at physicians specifically. So looking back at the research, there is a pro-white and anti-black implicit racial bias among pediatric, um, ac among academic pediatricians in leadership positions. There has been reports of poor recruitment efforts, poor retention, and lack of mentors for minority faculty. And this is something which I can say I've experienced firsthand. So I have, um, I'm, I've been grateful to have strong black minority mentors. I have yet to have a, a, a Asian minority faculty mentor to this point. With promotions, there's lower rates of promotion of equally qualified Black and Hispanic medical school faculty compared with whites. And then with research funding, through the NIH, R01 applications of Black scientists receive poorer impact scores and are less likely to be discussed by a full study section. And they're also less likely to be funded based upon topic choice. Another place where we see racism is among healthcare C-suites. So looking at hospital leadership, whereas minority patients make up about 30% of a hospital's patient load, the CEOs and board and leadership positions are only filled about 13% of the time by minority representation. And so if you don't have a uh, hospital leadership that makes up the same minority breakdown as your patients, it's gonna be hard for you to relate to those patients and to advocate for their needs. And so there's a big discrepancy here. There's a lot more physicians coming in of minority, but still we're not making it to those top executive leadership positions. And we have to look at this closely and ask why. So, we should look at this at our own institutions and figure out, are, are we hosts for racism? Are we, and how do we change this? So the treatment for changing this level of racism is within policies and practices, including anti-racist people on selection committees and on promotion committees and making a, a, a conscious effort to hire more minority leaderships, adding competencies that are related to implicit bias racism and cultural humility and preclinical and clinical training curriculum um, and teaching effectively patient provider communication styles. And change is possible. So a few examples that Ashwood did not know until I, I did this presentation and looked at the breakdown of my own hospital. So about a third of our board is represented by minorities, which is um, pretty representative of our, of our patient population. At Kaiser Permanente, about 43% of their board is made of minorities and 25% of their C-suite is. So, um, so we need to start advocating for ourselves and really looking at those positions of leadership and, and making sure that um, we are represented. So, okay, we talked about treatment for the host. And the next step to get rid of racism is to look at how it's being transmitted in healthcare. And this is a couple of different levels. So transmission of racism in medical education, how are we being taught about racism? So when I was in medical school, I was always taught that black people had a higher rate of hypertension, obesity, and diabetes than white people. I was never taught to question, why is that? I was taught that for some reason, black people were just physiologically inferior to white people, and that was that. Um, and so now we know, and so I'm so glad that you guys are getting lectures like this way early in, in your career so you can learn and start having these aha moments way sooner than I did. Um, but this really can be traced back to what Sylvia had mentioned uh, 
with a racial root. So the legacy of redlining and racial segregation. So if banks were not giving neighborhoods, especially people of color, loans, there was not money being put into those neighborhoods. There was no investments being made in those areas. Grocery stores don't want to go to areas where banks won't put money into. And so there was food deserts created. Sylvia talked about the poor schools and the education deficits in, in redlined communities. And then there's not enough money put into those neighborhoods for walking paths and bike lanes for physical exercise. So all of these things that are related to redlining come back to having worse health outcomes um, for people living in these, pop in, in these neighborhoods, which were populations of color. So these racist views, theories, and ideas are repeated all through medical education and training. A lot of times, preclinical medical school curriculum shows race as a biological difference. And if there's one take home point today, this is what I want you guys to leave here knowing, is that race is not a biological difference, but really experiencing racism in all forms is the risk factor for disease. And racism is the social construct that we need to work against every day in healthcare. So my med school teachers, when they taught me, you know, blacks had a higher rate of hypertension and, and diabetes, they didn't talk to me about redlining or food deserts or lack of access to, to hospitals or pharmacies or lack of access to healthy foods as cause for black people having higher rates of hypertension. So sometimes socioeconomic status can be confused with race, and this has been used time and time again in research. And so this is something we really need to start working against. Another way racism is transmitted in healthcare is from attending to trainees. So a level of interpersonal racism. So white residency applicants were more likely to be described as using standout or ability keywords like exceptional and best and outstanding compared to black, Hispanic, and Asian residency applicants, even when you controlled for step one scores and other demographic factors. So you have to wonder what implicit bias do people have here? Clinical faculty give Black, Latinx, and Asian medical students lower clinical rotation grades than white medical students, even when you control for the demographic factors and step one scores. Trainees of color report microaggressions from educators all the time. And, and I would say I had this experience too. So a couple of my own experiences with racism is, um, you know, a, a colleague will say, oh, you know, my, my friend is, is Indian and she's a doctor too. Her name is Dr. Patel. Do you, do you know her? Um, yeah, probably not. <laughs> so if you, you know, were to do that with, with a white friend of yours whose name is Dr. Smith, you know, would you think about asking something like that? No. I discussed the Asian minority bit than me being um, someone who's experienced that. And so the Asian, Asian Americans are, are described as the invisible minority. So to be able to migrate to America back when my parents did, you had to have a, have a higher degree of education to come to this country. So that was where part of the stigma started in that all Asian Americans are smart and successful and engineers and doctors. Um, and despite having this higher level of education, we are the least likely ethnic group to be promoted to management positions. Why is that if we're so highly educated? Um, so, so that's something which I've had experience with. I'll let Sylvia show, share some of her own experiences too. I was muted, sorry. <laughs> In my very first rotation of OBGYN, I never got to lay my hands on a baby the whole rotation since I was always assigned to tri uh, triage because my ability to speak Spanish was more convenient for them in the triage area than when a mother was pushing. And while I enjoy providing racially and linguistically concordant care, it wasn't fair to deprive me of even one opportunity to do what every other colleague of mine got to do during their rotation. As I was about to graduate from uh, residency, I witnessed an older white male OB attending who's about to perform a C-section on a Spanish speaking woman tell her husband learn English when he struggled on how to follow instructions on donning for the OR. I reprimanded the attending in private and then apologized to the husband on his behalf, telling him that neither of my parents spoke English or were doctors, but here I am about to take care of his first baby. 
Another way transmission occurs to the next generation. So we're passing this down from attending to fellow, fellow to resident, resident to med students. And then we looked at a study of medical students and residents with about 400 med students and residents. And about half of them reported at least one false belief about biological differences between black and white individuals, saying black people have less sensitive nerve endings, thicker skin, and stronger bones. A lot of those people with those same false beliefs, they would rate black patients' pain as being lower and make less appropriate treatment recommendations than people who did not have those false beliefs. So isn't it crazy that like even in today's age, half of our med students or residents are leaving their training with at least one false belief about, about black people. Um, and this, this significantly probably had um, something to do also with our opioid epidemic. When you think about the black patients' pain and being rated as lower, they were less likely to be prescribed opioids. And so white people were prescribed opioids excessively. And, and so that is one of the, the, um, the causes of, of the opioid crisis and can be linked back to a little bit of that too. So how are we transmitting racism? ourselves, our colleagues, our institutions. And what can we do about that? What is the treatment for transmission? Well, one, we have to check ourselves and we have to understand what our own implicit biases are. Um, so I'll let, I'll let you take the lead on this. Sure. Making sense of your own racial um, ethnic identity can help you process past experiences that shaped it, as well as provide tools to help navigate future experiences that will impact it. Um, and on here are some really awesome resources. Um, I love everything Embrace Race um, .org. Um, If you happen to be at one of our workshops, um, we are at AAP, SCBP, PAS, and we hope to see you again in the future. And these worksheets are pretty awesome. Next slide. We've been told that you have taken a version of the IAT, um, which is great to help enlighten those subconscious areas of bias, because as medical providers, we rely a lot on our institution reflex thinking to help us get through some complex scenarios like codes, and we don't want our implicit biases negatively impacting that. All right, so treatment for transmission. So we talked about checking ourselves and checking our own implicit biases and addressing interpersonal racism. On the institution level and also on a national level, when you start looking at changing our medical curriculum core competencies to include racism as a social construct and remove race as a biological entity. So recently I was part of a petition put forth by the American Academy of Pediatrics Section on Minority Health Equity and Inclusion, asking the American Board of Pediatrics to include content specifications that address racism versus race and ethnicity, because right now race is still listed as a biological entity under our, our content specifications. So we have to take it back to medical education and make these changes for us to make progress. Formal trainings like this, spreading the word about this, hiring more BIPOC people of color for leadership positions and continuing to have longitudinal anti-racism and am implicit bias training for healthcare professionals. You know, you don't attend one grand round and become an anti-racist for life. It, it takes work and it takes um, time. And so we have to all kind of commit to that process. All right, so we've taken care of racism at the host level. We've taken care of the transmission from one person to the other, and, and, and we've taken care of racism spreading like that. Now, how are we replicating racism um, on a daily basis in, in healthcare? So we're gonna take a second here to, um, to just survey um, you guys, because this is a question that comes up a lot that is used time and time again in medical research. You're, you're, and it's, you know, these are the categories by the U.S. Census. So what is your race? Um, how do you think about this question? Um, and I think, Jennifer, I, I might ask you for your help on, on putting the poll up. Of course, I'm going to go ahead and launch that now. All right, so if you guys can answer, you can mark more than one, um, or you can mark um, just one, whatever you feel like you identify with. So I, I've always hated this question because I hate being lumped in with um, 
Asians as a whole continent, you know, I think there's a lot of difference between Indian Asians versus um, versus Chinese Asian or um, Japanese Asian. Um, but these are categories that um, are identified by the US Census. It's important to know that when we talk about race as a social construct, the definition of a white person has changed over time. So way back in the day, Polish people weren't considered white. Jewish people weren't considered white. Um, Sylvia, I might have you just uh, talk about Bacon's Rebellion one more time here to hone in on that point and how the definition of white kind of changed and, and, and where that construct came about. Yeah, so in Virginia, um, they were rebelling. Um, it was slaves um, and former um, indentured servants, white um, former indentured servants were rebelling against um, the, the constructs that were in Virginia. Um, and so the way they were able to quash that um, was by giving some uh, rights to the whites that were part of the rebellion and not the blacks. So dividing them and not allowing them to come together um, to be able to continue their rebellion. And that's really where the concept of race, the social concept of race started here in the United States. Um, very important that, um, again, it's different for countries, especially if you're um, from somewhere else else, it might be a little different, like I'm thinking of um, Brazil and other areas where there's a, a big variety as well. Um, but that's how it started here in the US. Thank you, Sylvia. All right, well, this is great. 94% of people um, responded. Um, so I mostly put this in here just for you just kind of think about how you typically answer this. All right, so we're going to take a quick break to watch one of my favorite TED Talks that I feel like um, does a really good job of talking about racism in medical research and hones in on this part a little bit, um, a, a little bit better than I probably would do. Um, so bear with me through this technical change here. Got to get my TED talk up. Okay, and um, you guys, let me know. Can you see this? Um, okay. Are you able to see that you are okay? Fifteen years ago, I volunteered to participate in a research study that involved a genetic test. When I arrived at the clinic to be tested, I was handed a questionnaire. One of the very first questions asked me to check a box for my race, white, black, Asian, or Native American. I wasn't quite sure how to answer the question. Was it aimed at measuring the diversity of research participants' social backgrounds? In that case, I would answer with my social identity and check the box for black. But what if the researchers were interested in investigating some association between ancestry and the risk for certain genetic traits? In that case, wouldn't they want to know something about my ancestry, which is just as much European as African? And how could they make scientific findings about my genes if I put down my social identity as a black woman. After all, I consider myself a black woman with a white father rather than a white woman with a black mother entirely for social reasons. Which racial identity I check has nothing to do with my genes. Well, despite the obvious importance of this question to the study's scientific validity, I was told don't worry about it. Just put down however you identify yourself. So I checked black, but I had no confidence in the results of a study that treated a critical variable so unscientifically. That per So, so I think Dorothy Roberts really says it, um, says it best. So your race is not your genes, you guys. And so we, I really think it's time to stop using race in, in medical research. Um, so studies in medicine are based off of these arbitrary race categories. And like we mentioned, who was white back in the day is not white now. And what about mixed people? You know, what if your dad is black and you're white? Do you mark both boxes or do you mark your social identity? What about if you're adopted? Um, recently, I was binge watching Little Fires Everywhere and a white family adopted a Chinese baby and they marked the Chinese baby's race as being white because that was the family that 
the parents, that had, that, that's who the family had identified as. Another example of where racism is replicated in daily medical practice is with, oops, sorry, I don't know how to go back. There we go, okay. Um, is with glomerular uh, filtration rate, so the GFR. So GFR, this is a, a look at your kidney functioning. And so there is a normal value for black people and there is a normal value for non-black people. And you use, a, you use a certain equation, whether you're black or white. So your GFR, you take that number and if you're black, you multiply that by 1.2. So technically you can have a higher baseline GFR versus a white person. And this has been taught time and time again in medical schools and has been promoted by decades of peer reviewed research. Now, my question is how black do you have to be to use that equation? So this kind of comes down to your bias as a physician. So do you look at someone and say, hey, you look kind of black, like I'm gonna use this equation on you now. Um, do, you, do you go back to the EMR and look at what the, the, the family or the patient identified as? So if you look at the example, for example, the, um, the definition of chronic medical renal disease is a GFR less than 60. So if your GFR was 59 and you were white, um, you might get more intensive intervention. Whereas if you were black, you may be told, hey, like, don't worry about it. So how does this pan out long term? So this means that there's, so what this has shown in studies is that black people have a lower rate of stage three chronic kidney disease compared to white people, but they have higher rates of stage four and end stage renal disease. So essentially you're waiting longer to, to intervene for, for kidney disease. The same thing can be seen in, in pulmonary function tests. So it's barometry. So there's a correction factor of 10 to 15% for black people. Where did this come from? This came, this came from an assumption, a bad assumption made by Thomas Jefferson back in the, way back in the day, made to explain lung differences between slaves and white colonists. So he used this to justify poor conditions in which slaves lived. The reality is that blacks are not biologically born with a decreased lung capacity, but the lower force vital capacity was more associated with exposure to toxic environments and social conditions, notably living in poverty. So the idea that people labeled white naturally have a higher lung capacity compared to other races throughout the world really should be approached with some skepticism. So how do we... Whoops. All right, sorry. So how do we replicate racism? We have to think about this. And what's the treatment for this? We have to get past using race and ethnicity as a descriptive variable that's usually table one on every research paper that we look at. Instead, we need to start looking at perceived acts of racism, exposure to adversity, toxic stress, adverse childhood experiences, and socioeconomic status, and not just race. Another institution, so the University of Washington Medical School, they have taken a stance. They made the historic decision to no longer use race as a variable to estimate kidney function. And so that is showing that they're, they are refusing to participate in the perpetuation of racism in medical practice. Um, so they as an institution have decided not to use that, that um, the race-based equation to calculate kidney function. Is that something we need to be doing on a national level? Maybe. All right, so we've talked about treatment for the host level, for stopping transmission, for stopping replication in, in medicine. Now, how does racism cause disease? So we talked about the effects of structural racism in causing some disease with redlining. So some of the examples I gave you were having higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Another example of redlining is that because of that, there's been less investments put in hospitals in minority hospitals. So on Chicago's South Side, which is predominantly black, 
only two out of 12 of the hospitals meet national guidelines for cancer care. The result of that is that black women in Chicago are 40% less likely than white women to have mammograms. So if you don't have a hospital that meets standard of care for cancer guidelines in your neighborhood, are you going to take the bus 40 miles to the north side of Chicago to get your mammogram done? Probably not. Sylvia is going to talk about the adverse birth outcomes um, that's also related to this. We also look at the effects of redlining and, and racism in the community on decreased air quality and water quality. So think about what happened in, with the Flint water crisis and higher levels of lead in the water there. If you're living in an area that has poor air pollution, you're going to have a higher rate of asthma in that population and COPD. A recent study that just came out um, in August, they looked at 1.8 million hospital births in Florida. And when black babies were cared for by white physicians, they were three times more likely to, to suffer from mortality um, and to die in the hospital than their white counterparts. When you compared black physicians and white physicians across the board, the black newborns remain more likely to die than white newborns. This is in Florida, guys. Why are black babies dying? We have to start looking at this closely and, and realize it's not a biological cause. We have to look at the social determinants of health that are contributing to these differences. So the mortality data for black mothers and black babies continues to be dismal, even though our medical knowledge and technology continues to improve. Why is that? It's not because of the social construct that is race. And those numbers that I'm showing you are very dismal. Next slide. So what's very interesting, and I think you might have to click through, Shuri, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, what's really interesting is that African-born Black mothers that moved to the United States have numbers that are similar to those of white U.S. mothers shown in the last slide, and not that of American-born Black mothers. Next slide. I think you may have to click through. Yeah, perfect. Um, however, when that American-born Black baby of an African-born Black mother has children of her own, now her numbers suddenly become the dismal set that I showed earlier and not reflective of her mother. Next slide. So it's not due to genetics. Studies are showing that the accumulative effect of racism in early life, such as racism's impact on ACEs, that in turn causes allostatic changes in developing bodies of children. That is what's causing numerous negative health outcomes, such as the dismal numbers that I showed you and as well as other things that um, Dr. Mittal referred to earlier. Next slide. And so I love quoting um, Dr. Spanks Franklin um, on this, but she says that you really can't breathe in toxic fumes and not get sick yourself. So multiple studies have shown that racism has these negative effects on American whites compared to whites in other countries, compared to other races in the U.S., and even compared to American whites who have endorsed less racist beliefs. Next slide. So what is the treatment for disease? We need to invest in our communities we need to advocate and vote for policy changes at the state and federal level. We need to invest in racial socialization efforts. And we need to work towards developing a healthy racial identity in ourselves, our colleagues, and the next generation of physicians. So we talked about all the different steps in which we have to work towards dismantling racism, really to stop the, the, the cycle of the pathogen. I'll just I'll leave this with uh, Sylvia's um, adorable little son, Rui. So racism isn't born, folks. It's taught. I have a two-year-old son. You know what he hates? Naps. End of list. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We'll take um, any questions at this point. I don't know if you guys can see the chat, but there is a, a, a question in here that came up earlier when you were talking about um, studies that look at race. Has there ever been a study that asked this question with a free response answer rather than the categories that you have to choose? It feels like that would be a much better option than listing solid choices that probably don't reflect what the majority of people would identify as. 
Yes. Is this in regards to the census? Was that probably when it came up? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll defer to Shruti as well. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't come across one of those studies yet. Um, and I agree. It's such a rigid um, answer choice compared to, I mean, for the reasons that Dr. Mittal uh, mentioned earlier, I know maybe not for the census because I'm much better about it now, but I remember being um, younger and being like, I don't fit any of this. So I'd put other, like I might answer would change all the time. So I agree with um, Spencer that it really um, does not reflect the, the majority, but to my knowledge, no, you Shruti? Nope, not that I know of, but I would love to see like a word cloud that came out of free response answers um, because, it, yeah, it would be very interesting and um, eye-opening to see what a majority of people did identify as. It looks like we have another question in here. Um, Sylvia, when you reprimanded your senior for his comment of the Learn English, did you experience any backlash? If so, how did you navigate your relationship with that position moving forward? Jonathan, I was wondering the exact same thing. Thank you for asking. So where I did my residency program, um, we did um, one month at a smaller community hospital that didn't have pediatrics. So in that one month, um, as the third year pediatric resident, I covered the ER, the NICU, newborn nursery, and all C-sections. Um, and so it was a, a tough month. Uh, so I didn't really have much of a lasting relationship with that um, institution, but I, I was very grateful that this was my third year, that I had the confidence of a third year resident as opposed to maybe an intern. Um, and I just knew that I had to stand up for what was right. I was like, I can't believe he said that to that patient. I was just devastated. And so thankfully I, I felt very confident, put him in his place, wrote up, like, I, it wasn't just that, like, I told the person that I reported to what had happened, um, because it needs to be addressed. And what I tend to do is run, just like you run, you do mock codes, like, okay, if a patient faints, this is what I'm going to do. I do that with racial things as well. Like if someone were to say, speak English, if I were to come across a scenario, like I practice those things in my head. So that way I don't clam up. Um, if they were to happen, it really has served me well. Um, because I definitely have encountered those scenarios being a very fair, light-skinned, dye my hair Latina. <laughs> Thank you. Along um, the lines, you know, just on an individual level, that's so important that, you know, there's always that chance of, um, of some, like, lashback or, like, you getting a bad evaluation or just, you know, fear of speaking up. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to always remember, like, what's right in our hearts. Um, and I think only if we start talking about these issues and calling people out for making microaggressive comments um, or talking over our, our friends of color or our colleagues of color, um, is change gonna, is gonna come, come about? So um, Thank I think you. That, that's kind of Jonathan's question, I think. Yeah, um, there's, a follow, it, there's a follow up in here about how you navigate microaggressions moving forward in careers. And I think this is really important. One thing, one, kind of uh, change that I've observed over my 13 years being around is that students are coming in more and more educated about health disparities and, and racism and things like that. And so they are noticing a lot of these missteps that their faculty and their attendings are, are making. And so how do they navigate that? How, what would you recommend? And then we'll get to Sonia's question. So I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I think there's a variety of things that need to, that, that can be done for you, not that they need to be done, but can be done. Um, and it really, again, depends on different scenarios, but um, I think creating a safe place to talk about it, um, like, hey, is there a time that I can talk to you about something um, personal or, or however you want to phrase it? Because that might not be the right time. Like it might be in the middle of rounds and in it might be awkward to just stop patient care surrounded by peers, but I think it's important to address it because as I mentioned before, it's impact, not intent. So that person might not have intended that and you're going to help them grow. Um, so I think creating a safe place um, and a safe time to discuss is really important. I think finding community, finding someone that you can um, talk to. I've had def different people. I've been like, Hey, can I tell you, can I ask you something as Sylvia and not as your da da da, like your fellow, your whatever, your trainee, et cetera. Um, and having those personal talks. So I think that's an option having an advocate. And then also, um, I think kind of referring to the question that Sonia had asked, um, are there organizations, are there institutional things in place that can also be safe places to discuss it, safe places to guide it. And also things have to trickle down. So hopefully there are DNI initiatives and activities 
activities and uh, training that can permeate through that to help people also at different times realize like, oh gosh, maybe when I said that to that one medical student five years ago, that was a microaggression. So a variety of levels, I think are important, Jonathan. Thank you, Sylvia. And one thing I can tell the first year students is that in block five, you will have a um, training on how to be an active bystander in the face of microaggressions. And it will cover what to do if you are the recipient, um, if you're a bystander, or even if you're the source of the microaggression. So just stay tuned for that. Um, and as for Sonia's questions, I don't know that we have anything specific um, at our School of Medicine. I know we have a scholarly concentration in medical social justice that I think addresses some of the issues around structural racism. I know that diversity dialogues can be a safe space where you can talk about these things and we often talk about what's happening specifically at UNR Med and what we can do differently um, and those diversity dialogues are once a month but Sonia maybe this is something that we we start together and we can we can work on it um, there are a couple of other questions here um, one is regarding uh, the PowerPoint touching on black babies and mortality in comparison to white babies but what is the research on um, Hispanic and Asian babies in comparison and also Native Americans? Any data there? I would have to get back to, uh, I'm assuming it's pronounced the lilac. I hope I, I said that correctly. Um, I would have to get back to you on that. Um, the numbers are, we just know much more dismal for um, black moms and babies. Um, but I would love to either send um, email to the team to, to highlight on that, but um, not off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with. It. I just know it's not unfortunate, but again, with the Native American numbers, it is a much smaller population. Um, so I, 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 again, with the level of racism and the resources, I'm not assuming they're not super duper different than the black, but I would have to get back to you if that were okay. Well, and, and can I add to that or just ask something related to that question. Um, so it was really interesting that the, the racial concordance between the doctor and the patient and how the babies fared better. And I want, I mean, obviously we need to increase the, the representation of, and have more diversity in medicine, but I wonder, has there been any study that looks at training um, training folks who are not necessarily racially concordant um, on things like cultural humility, cultural sort of sensitivity. And does that cause any difference? Because I'd like to think that there's some hope um, <laughs> for, for everyone else. I think a lot of the um, like anti-racism training curriculums are so new that there's not much data out there that looks at that information longitudinally. Like I would love to follow this set of med students, for example, um, you know, 10 years down the line and then look at those outcomes later on. Because if you look at this information, it was from 1992 to 2015, where, you know, I think we're only starting to become so aware of how ingrained racism is in, in everyday medicine um, that I think repeating this, a similar study again would, would definitely um, be helpful and is needed. I think every institution has different layers of, of anti-racism training and um, cultural humility training. So I think you know, trying to figure out what best practices are with that, there's still so much research that has to be done in that area too. Yeah, um, just last week, we had our annual conference for our society. Um, and during our um, DEI committee meeting, um, they had just started like, they're like, okay, we're going to start a research with all the trainees. And we're going to look into this. So I mean, that's what's coming out now. So I am, like uh, Sheree said, really excited um, about what's to come. And did any of those studies look a little bit deeper into what was it about the racial concordance that kind of contributed towards the better outcomes? Like, was it more time spent? You know, I mean, what did it boil down to? I think like, if I'm not mistaken, in the, the, the discussion section, it's like one of those, like the discussion points, like, I don't think it was part of the results, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. Trudy. Yeah, yeah, I think um, one of the conclusions that they came down to, because they didn't look at time and, and other factors, I think that that's really hard to gauge, but they came down to just maybe those providers being more compassionate and just being able to be able to relate on, on that level and go that extra step. Um, but I'm happy to send that article to you, um, Dr. Jacobs, if you wanted to send it out. And um, it would probably be great for a journal club. Um, it's been a little while since I looked at 
the paper in detail, but that's kind of what I had gotten from it in general. Thank you. There's a couple of um, additional questions that kind of relate to the same thing about how do you navigate macro aggressions um, where people might be openly racist? And then specifically, how would you deal with that um, as a physician when that comes from a patient? Yeah, so I think this is interesting. So um, my husband is an internal medicine hospitalist, um, and he's also Indian. And he's talked about how sometimes patients will request another provider who's not a provider of color. And his hospital group has made a stance that they that patients are not allowed to request that. It's like, sorry, um, you're going to have to see this doctor, and that's just it. And, of course, that comes down to being very um, – I mean, it, it can be awkward, like in real life, right? If you go into the room and you know that you're not wanted as, as a patient's um, physician. And so then it comes down to like, well, do you have a right as a provider too to say like, okay, well, this patient obviously doesn't want to take care of me and my patient satisfaction scores might be, you know, uh, impacted by that. But it's, it's really tricky. Um, so I personally don't, but my, um, my husband has had to navigate that and the complexity. I'm curious, Dr. Jacobs, if you have... Um, if you've had that experience, well, you, or, or have you guys talked about that at all? Um, so one thing I'm, I'm just aware of is, is in the literature. And, and we looked into this here at UNR Med because we were wondering if we needed a policy that's similar. And um, one thing that I found out that in some places, it's actually so bad that residents are suing because they are not getting um, the opportunities. Like Sylvia, you talked about not ever being able to deliver a baby and, and for a different reason, but, but that in some places, residents are being turned away by patients and it's so bad that they're not actually getting the, the, the treatment that they want. The thing is, it's, it's kind of complicated because when you're dealing with patients, you're dealing with people that are sick. And so depending on the nature of the illness, um, you know, you know, are they, are they delirious? Are they, um, are they just so hurting? You know, what, what are they able to make these decisions? You know, do, do we need to be a little bit more sympathetic with them because they're, they're, they're compromised and they're vulnerable. And then in some situations, it might actually be appropriate to request a, a doctor. So for example, you know, if you're a woman that has had sexual trauma and you don't want to be treated by a man, then maybe it might be appropriate for you to, re to request that you not be seen by a man. So I, I think it's, it's complicated, but I do definitely think that it's something that we're seeing um, more and more recently is this more overt and explicit racism. Um, and we're seeing it. There's a lot of literature and articles that have been written about it for those of you that might be interested. And there's kind of not necessarily a consensus about how to how to address it. Some doctors say, "Hey, I don't I don't need to take this. I don't deserve this. And you know, I'm going to fire you from my practice, or we're not going to see you." And then other doctors advocate being more compassionate, understanding that the patient is sick and they're vulnerable, and you know, really kind of trying to be trying to rely on the professionalism of, of our field and, you know, rise above that and take care of the patient. But there's not a consensus that I'm aware of, but it's definitely a, a, a tricky issue. Um, there's a couple of additional wonderful, um, I don't know if you can touch on these in the last like 90 seconds that we have here, um, minority representation in leadership positions, specifically some specialties that um, have historically not admitted women to residency programs like ortho, um, neuro, et cetera. And, um, and does this uh, affect patient care? So that's an interesting question. And then a little bit uh, of a further question regarding University of Washington's decisions to not include race in the GFR calculation. Fantastic question. So as far as the uh, U of W, I have not seen any follow up studies from that, um, but I'm sure that they're planning on doing that in the future and it would be a great idea too as well. Um, and then as far as minority representation within different specialties, I think um, minority doctors are more likely to go into primary care. Um, than, sub, than specialties. And I, I don't know if that's like a, a foreign graduate thing um, or not. So do you know about that? Um, definitely, I know foreign graduate, um, but that also includes like IMGs, like um, 
those of us that went to Caribbean schools and stuff. So that um, is there. I think that the end is just probably so small because we already are diluting it to again, how many um, URM are in medicine and then subdividing it. I, I think the end might be too small. And so that's why nothing really stands out, um, but it, it's tough. And that's why I think um, we, we try to advocate um, for retention, not just at the faculty level, not just at the residency, not just, the, but we gotta start young or college students or um, I work very closely here in Charleston with um, high school students. Um, so at least once a year, they um, someone that identifies as um, underrepresented or minority um, to rotate with me because again, seeing like, oh my gosh, here's an immigrant doctor who look at <laughs> look how high she's gotten, look what she's doing, or someone that looks like you can be really um, great because I know that I've been shot down in the past. Oh, you'll never get it. You'll what? You're in the honor society? How did that happen? Like again, all these mi micro macro aggressions. Well, I want to be respectful of time, and I see that we are at one o'clock. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, this afternoon, and I particularly would like to thank our speakers. Um, you guys absolutely hit it out of the ballpark. I love the analogy of looking at racism as a as a pathogen, and all of the treatments that you um, have have suggested at each step of the process. So, again, if you need CMEs, please contact um, Jennifer Doherty for the form, and then the Palm students, your reflection, which I'm so eager to read, will be due this Friday, uploaded to Canvas by 5 p.m. Um, if there are any additional questions, maybe you could pop them into, um, into the chat, and then I can try to get your responses um, from our speakers. But again, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon.